Well, hello, I'm Rick Gilbert. I'm a member of the library board, and I want to welcome you to our second Tom Toomey event of the season. Rita Braver and Robert Barnett are without a doubt one of the most formidable couples in Washington, D.C. Rita is a national correspondent on the CBS Sunday Morning Program, where she reports on the arts, culture, politics, and foreign policy. In the first term of Bill Clinton's administration, she served as the chief CBS White House correspondent. And during her long and distinguished career at CBS News, she's won so far 10 National Emmy Awards. <laughs> Robert is a leading attorney and senior partner in the DC law firm Williams and Conley, whose clients have included Barack Obama, Bill Clinton, and George Bush, among many others. His outstanding legal and political resume is simply too long to list in the short introduction, and I urge you all to read Wikipedia tonight. <laughs> Last January, on behalf of the library board, I extended an invitation to both Rita and Robert to participate in the Tom Toomey series. And we're very fortunate to have them with us here today in the to give us a unique perspective on reporting news in Washington, D.C. in the current political environment. Now tonight, Robert will be interviewing Rita, and while Rita has been interviewed many times in the past, I suspect not often by Robert, <laughs> There will be a brief question and answer period after the interview. Now please welcome Rita Braver and Robert Barnett. Thank you. <laughs> Testing, one, two, three, one. Hello, East Hampton. Thank you for being here tonight. I'd like to start by introducing uh, some special guests we have here tonight who are special people in our lives. First, my daughter, our daughter Meredith, our son-in-law Daniel, Daniel's parents Joe and Ann Penn, and a friend of 50 years, Marge Koloff. Please welcome our guest. <laughs> this is a unique experience because I get to ask whatever I want. <laughs> but she also has the right to plead the Fifth Amendment. So I thought I'd start by asking Rita to give a little background and tell the folks where you were born and where you went to school and just a little resume so they're up to speed before we you start. You didn't think they Googled me before no, they came? No, You did, right? So you don't. Um, first of all, I just want to say what a pleasure it is to be in this beautiful library. I have spent many happy afternoons here with my granddaughter and it's one of her place, favorite places to come, and I think it is really one of the treasures of East Hampton, and it's really an honor to be here. Um, and I don't know why my grandsons have never come here with me, but I'll have to change that. Um, you know, I can't remember when I didn't want to be a, television, uh, a news reporter. When I was about eight years old, I started a newspaper on my block, and I think to keep me occupied, because you know, there, weren't, there were no Xeroxes, much less um, computers. I wrote each one out by hand and then went around and sold them for a nickel to all the neighbors. Mrs. Katikis is planting petunias this year instead of geraniums, all the local news. I started a newspaper at my junior high. It, it shocks young women when I say this, but in um, 1966, I was the first girl to be editor-in-chief of my high school newspaper. And I wanted, to be a, uh, I wanted to be a newspaper reporter. I never thought of working in television. I really thought that um, you only worked in television if you weren't smart enough to work at a newspaper. <laughs> that still may be true. I know you <laughs> heard from some newspaper reporters here, so you'll make a decision after tonight. And um, I grew up in Washington, D.C. My parents read three newspapers every day thoroughly. My dad, uh, his way of uh, playing games with me, I see that my son-in-law likes to do members of the Rangers with his sons. My father had me learn the members of the Supreme Court in the order in which they sat. 
I learned the John F. Kennedy cabinet. I'm only, the only person in America who remembers Anthony Celebrezzi. Um, so that was how I started. Now, we, after college, <coughs> we went to New Orleans, and you thought that you would get a print job. That was your goal, as you said. But you ended up in television. Tell the folks how that first entry job came about. I should say that I had the good fortune to go to the University of Wisconsin, where when I was a sophomore, I uh, had a date with a uh, young man who asked me to marry him on the first date. <laughs> I said no, and he didn't ask me for five more years again. So I don't, I don't take rejection well. We, uh, we went to New Orleans because Bob got a clerkship with a very famous federal judge named John Minor Wisdom, who was one of the judges who was the most significant in desegregating the South. Um, and so I went around, the newspapers told me they wouldn't hire me unless I went to work in a small town like Houma, Louisiana. And I thought growing up in Washington that New Orleans wasn't such a big place. But I, I had, so I decided that I'd try the news stations and I went around with a little pile of resumes and my clips from my college newspaper. And you know, today if you did that, you, they would think you were a stalker and they wouldn't let you in. But I finally ended up at the CBS affiliate and the uh, receptionist, I walked into the FM radio station in the CBS, at the CBS affiliate and the uh, lovely receptionist there said to me, look, we don't have news here. The only real news here is in television. But if you go in the front door and leave your resume, they'll never call you. So here's what you do. You go through the garage and you're gonna come to a building that looks like a warehouse, but it's really the newsroom stand out there and wait for one of the reporters to come out and ask him to bring you in and introduce you to the news director. So I did. The guy who came out happened to be the sportscaster. It turned out that he had once gone to a University of Wisconsin Rose Bowl game, had the time of his life, and brought me in to the news director and said, this is Rita Braver. She knows everything there is to know about television. I want you to hire her and walked out, and I had never been in a television station before. But, so I, I had this uh, conversation with a guy who said, well, we have, the news director said, we have a job for a copy girl. Does anybody here know what a copy girl does? So all you young people think a copy girl is somebody who does Xeroxing. But a copy girl was someone, in those days, there were these huge teletype machines. That's how we got the news from the wire service. You used to hand the, you used to pull the, the wire copy off and you had to take it around to the different reporters who were working on the stories that United Press International, Associated Press kind of, and Reuters, some of those names of the past, um, were uh, what they were reporting. And he looked at me and he said, look, frankly, we've never thought of a girl for the job. So I went home. I wrote them one of those, if there's a young person in here, whenever you have a job interview, always write a letter. I wrote one of those letters you're supposed to write. I was desperately, um, and I had other interviews, but none of them, nothing ever happened. They all said, we'd love to hire you, we don't have any jobs. I was walking out of the house to sign up to make some money to be a school teacher, and the phone rang, remember, no voicemail then, no email then. He was not the kind of person who would have called back. I somehow ran back inside, because I was already outside, and he said, you can have the job. And I thought, you know, that letter really worked. And he said, yeah, we can't find a guy to take it for the money we're going to pay. <laughs> How many women in this room got their first job that way? I bet a lot of you, right? Um, and so that was how, but when I left, um, he told me that he wanted to hire a woman to do the job that I was doing. So that was great. And I got to work at CBS. <laughs> now she's, she's modest. She started, I'll fill in the footnote. <laughs> she started as a copy, it was a copy boy, wasn't right. it? Right, they yeah. couldn't say girl. They would say introduce girl. me, this is a copy boy, but she's a girl. Yeah, <laughs> she started as a copy boy. And by the end of the year, she was the producer of the six and 10 o'clock news. That's my wife. Uh, oh, now, okay. now this somehow, somehow we then moved to Washington and you got a job with the network. Tell them about how that happened. Oh, well, I, I just 
honestly, I, hap I was lucky, again, because I happened to um, be coming to Washington when the networks were looking around and saying, hey, we need to get us some women. And any woman who had television experience pretty much could get a job. I'd never gone on the air before, um, but I went to ABC News and had an interview, and, and they offered me a job. I went to CBS, and they offered me a job, and I decided, you know, Walter Cronkite. So I went to CBS, and I started behind the scenes, and gradually um, I became the law correspondent, which was a job that I really loved um, because it, I was originally hired really to cover what I called the sex, drugs, violence, and rock and roll beat, which was all the stuff I was interested in. <laughs> and I spent much of my early career on the drug story. It's funny, now we have an opioid story, but it was the beginning of the crack era. And it was in those days you could go out on raids with um, the Drug Enforcement Agency or the FBI wearing a bulletproof vest. And um, it was interesting at the beginning, but then I began to, I really began to feel sorry for the people who were being raided, not because I didn't think they were doing something wrong, but because usually they lived in such miserable areas and they were so poor. And um, it, it, I felt like our drug policy, something was wrong with that. And I still think that our country still have, has to figure all of that out. Now, as we watched the Supreme Court final week this week, uh, you, when you were covering the Supreme Court, you invented a whole new way to cover the court. Tell them about that. Well, before I, be, before I went on the air, I was a producer for the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. And I, um, I was asked, by, because I should mention that after we lived in New Orleans and Bob clerked uh, for a federal judge down there, he got the wonderful job of clerking for a Supreme Court justice in Washington for Justice Byron White, if any of you remember him. Um, the only justice that John Kennedy was able to appoint to the Supreme Court. And since I was interested in legal affairs, the then Supreme Court uh, correspondent asked me if I would work on the beat with him. And he sort of came up with the idea that there were a couple of stories that you could get out in front of and shoot. There were some big important stories the year that I started doing it, things on that we're still arguing about like affirmative action. And the idea would be you go to the homes of the people whose cases were in the Supreme Court and interview them about um, how they got there because most people don't expect ever that their case will end up in the US Supreme Court. And so we started doing that and then I realized, well, this is the only beat where you can really, you know, the justices announce a calendar. They tell you when they're going to hear cases. And based on when they hear them, you can figure out pretty much when they're going to um, decide them. And so you want to have these stories ready to roll when the, either the arguments or the decisions come down. I developed the idea that stories were more interested, interesting at the time of argument because then you and your husband or your friend get in an argument over which side is right because these cases don't get to the Supreme Court unless each side has a really strong argument. That's why they're there, because both sides have a great argument. Anyway, he left and um, I got to cover the Supreme Court and that was honestly, that was part added to my beat, sex, drugs, violence, rock and roll, and the Supreme Court. <laughs> and. Um, what was the most interesting Supreme Court case you covered no, during I, those years? I want to just say one thing about covering the court because the justices are so fascinating. And when you get to the court, if they think you're serious about covering the court and you have to prove to them that you're serious, I mean, I, my Supreme Court pass was like number eight or something. That's how few regular passes they gave out. And you really had to prove that you were serious about covering the court. And when you go, to start covering the court, at least when I went, you were allowed to um, send a letter to each justice and ask to go and have uh, a meeting, almost like presenting diplomatic credentials, once you were credentialed at the Supreme Court. And you get to meet them, it's off the record, but you get a feeling for them as human beings, and pretty much after that, they'll never speak to you again unless you run into them at the party, which happens a lot in Washington. Before we get to the most interesting case, tell them the story of how Meredith 
was the first fetus ever rec recognized from the Supreme Court bench. Oh, my husband loves this story. I was, Byron White was notorious for hating reporters. Um, he hated them from when he was a football player, and they hounded him. And you know how many professional football players who've um, gone to Harvard Law School uh, are there, but, and that's why he was so fascinating to them. And then he becomes a Supreme Court Justice. And he actually, when I went around to visit all of the Supreme Court Justices, he wouldn't see me. And I saw him at his house. And I said, why wouldn't you let me come in your office? And he said, because you already know me. You don't have to meet me in the Supreme Court. Um, but one day I was in there, and I was um, very pregnant. And a messenger, because justices all have all these messengers standing behind them in arguments. Have any of you ever been to a Supreme Court argument? You should really go. It's absolutely fascinating. Um, and they, one of them came into the press section, which never happens. And it was a note from Justice White that said, hey, when, about meaning when was Meredith going to be born. And we still have that note. It's hanging in her old room. <laughs> so, First um, fetus ever re <laughs> recognized from the Supreme Court bench. Now, what's the most interesting case you covered you know, it I think there were so, every, every Supreme Court case is interesting, and what's really fascinating is that you, uh, you get to meet the people who have the cases. You get to understand the humanity of it. I've talked with justices about this in later years. They don't get to ever meet those people. They're not really, they're thinking about the law. They're deciding what does the law say about this, not what, not you know, not the stories of these individuals. Um, probably <coughs> the most powerful story I ever covered in the Supreme Court was a right to die case where a young woman was in a coma for many years in what's called a persistent vegetative state. And after she was in it for about 15 years, no signs of life, her parents finally wanted to take her off um, life support. And a, um, uh, an attorney general of the state of Missouri got very involved in the case and decided that she could not be taken off of life support. And the reason was that he was a pro-choice, uh, I mean a, um, a pro-life person. And he thought, well, if you take someone off life support, you're killing them in the same way that you're killing someone with an abortion. And he had big designs of running for higher political office. And these poor, anguished parents, um, he, he basically said in court that they just wanted to take their daughter off life support for their own convenience. And I remember sitting in the house with these parents. They were crying, and I was crying. Um, the Supreme Court decided that case in favor of the parents. Um, the uh, uh, attorney general who brought the case ended up going to jail for expense account fraud. Um, but the sad part was that after the daughter was taken off life support, the father killed himself. And that's one that has stayed with me forever because you can see um, how someone can be tormented and made to feel that what they think they're doing for their child is the right thing is the wrong thing, and it was just, it was such a tragedy. So that w that's one. I'm sorry to say something so sad. Um, you know, there were happy cases too, I'll say. We should move on. Now <laughs> then, um, then you moved to the White House beat, Chief White House Correspondent, and I was representing the Clintons at the time, so I had to recuse, which broke my heart, but I won best husband at our condo. <laughs> True story. <laughs> So what was covering Bill Clinton like, really? <laughs> you know, somebody asked me that earlier here. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of work. I was always, I have to say, I was always really um, pissed off. I shouldn't say that. But he was, uh, he, he was always late. And he was always like two hours late. Not just like five minutes late. And so I would have to get up in the morning to get to Andrews Air Force Base like at 3 o'clock in the morning because he was going to do an event in some city we were flying to at 8 o'clock in the morning, only he wouldn't arrive till 10. So I was always surly, I'd say. So I, that, that probably, looking back, may have colored my feelings about it. Um, but seriously, and I'm, 
just joking about all this. He was, uh, I have interviewed Nobel Prize winners. I've interviewed some really interesting people in my career. He's definitely one of, if not the smartest people I've ever met. And so that was really interesting, to be around someone with that uh, intellectual level. Um, I sometimes think, and I was, uh, he used to tell people that he thought that I was really tough on him because he knew, I knew that Bob liked him and I wanted to prove that I wasn't being manipulated by my husband. But I think I was tough on him because, frankly, every decision that every president makes is always political. So one day you're covering a president and he stands there and says, um, I can, you know, we can't balance the budget. We can't have a balanced budget because the country will fall apart if we have a balanced budget. And then one day his political advisor tells him, well, you need to balance the budget. So he comes out and says, you know, I think we can balance the budget. Or he says, we can't do welfare reform until we do health care. Well, we all know what happened to health care in the Clinton administration, but they were still able to do welfare reform. So, and, and that's true. That's the case in every single administration. I, I only covered this White House, but I covered peripherally White Houses and frequently politicians, and we, we see this with our current president certainly, will insist, you know, Mexico has to build the wall. Mexico is building the wall. And then the reality of it sets in. And we, we're not hearing about Mexico building the wall anymore. So I think that just kind of goes with the territory. But it was really fun. You're on the road with really fascinating people. I loved the uh, other correspondents. There was a period when I was kind of afraid to fly. And uh, Wolf Blitzer claims that he still has nail marks in his hand from every time we took off and landed. Um, but I got to meet, I loved the other correspondents. It was interesting to meet people in the administration, some of whom I still know, and they have completely different jobs, but they've gone on to do really interesting things. And you travel around the world, and suddenly you are in, you know, I, I remember being in one small situation where, um, I, do you know, the, when the president goes somewhere, the whole press corps cannot go with him. So the networks, one network correspondent can go into all of the small meetings with the president. And usually it's your job to shout out a question. You've all seen those photo ops. Um, and so it was my turn to be the pool reporter. We landed in Thailand. They had turned off all the lights in the city except for the temples. So it was this magical evening. And I was in the press car, which got to follow the president. And remember, the rest of the press corps had gone straight to the hotel and the filing center. And I was the only TV correspondent. And they finally said, OK. And, and we drove up to the king's house and to his palace. And it was lined with um, soldiers on white horses in white uniforms. And we went in. They said, you can go in if you promise not to say anything when, if the president brings you in, you can go in with the staff when he's going to bring in the king to meet his staff. And I thought, well, you know, OK, I'll make this promise this time. And so sure enough, we go into this little room, and there are all these beautiful women. And they are the ladies in waiting to the Queen of Thailand. And she has many of them. And they're only, well, I shouldn't say many of them. There were about 10 of them. And there were probably about 10 or 12 of us. And the president comes in with the king of Thailand and introduces me to the king of Thailand. And I could just see him looking at me and going, if you say one thing, I am going to kill you. But I, I didn't, and now I've met the king of Thailand. Now I'm going to ask so you to great. tell two Clinton stories that I love. <laughs> First, emblematic of his intelligence, which you noted. Tell them about the time you and Todd Purdom were up late and he came back. Oh, well... Usually, again, when you're on Air Force One, you do that, you rotate who gets to ride on Air Force One. And um, Clint, it, when the president speaks, it's usually on the record. That's what the reporters want. The president talks, we want a reporter. We don't want it to be off the record. Um, and his, Bill Clinton loved to co come back and talk to the press. Not every president does. And he, um, his press secretary would always hover over him to tell him what, you know, what he couldn't say, what we couldn't report. It would all be at negotiation. 
And one day, all of his keepers fell asleep. So the president wandered back to the press area. And I was sitting um, with a reporter then for the New York Times, now writes mostly for Vanity Fair, named Todd Pertham. And he was reading a book by a theologian that someone I'd never heard of, but Todd had had a recent loss in his family. Paul Tillich. And that's right, it was Paul Tillich. And um, it was, it was a, uh, honestly something that was a little bit over my head, but I think you read it in high school. But anyway, Bill Clinton had read the book in college, and he started talking about it with Todd. And I was just listening to th this conversation. And when Clinton walked out, Todd said to me, you know, I'm just reading the book. And I can't believe the detail that he can remember, the quotes that he can remember, and the way in which he's analyzed the book. And we were just kind of both bored by that. The other story I love is when you were at the press conference in a foreign context and you asked a question that almost destroyed world peace. Oh, <laughs> Clinton, Bill Clinton went to, um, he actually went to Syria. And he met with Haf Hafez Assad, the father of the uh, current president. And he was trying, it was very unusual. He'd met with him in Switzerland, and he agreed to go to Syria. And no Americans, believe me, had ever gone into Syria, especially not a president. We were just going for a day trip. And um, we, we rode through this. Uh, Assad would go to different palaces around the country. And he would never say, the people never knew he had all these huge palaces. Uh, he'd never say where he was because he was so afraid of getting assassinated. And so he went to one that was about two miles away, uh, two hours away from the airport. That's how far we had to drive. And we had a news conference at the end of it. And so they handpicked some reporters that they didn't think were going to ask questions that were, would offend Assad. But I thought, well, I'm just going to get in line anyway. So I got in line with the reporters who'd been chosen, and so did another reporter who was from the Jerusalem Post. And somehow we both got to ask our question. And um, I asked the question of, of why they were still a terrorist nation. Here we were um, meeting with them, and they were still supporting terrorism. And they were paying for it. And he got so mad, he just, uh, Assad just stormed off. And afterward, on the plane coming back, Clinton came in to yell at me for, almost, you know, for totally ruining his summit. But when you're a reporter, those are the questions that you're asked. You're, you're supposed to ask those questions. You're not supposed to ask the questions they want you to ask. Clinton was mad, but I loved it. <laughs> I thought it was great. Now, you moved from the White House to the best news broadcast on television, CBS Sunday Morning. Talk a little bit about the jurisdiction and breadth of, of that show, and then we'll talk about some specific stories. Have any of you ever watched Sunday Morning? Raise your hands if you've ever seen it. Okay, so, all right, so you know. These are your people. We're very lucky. Well, we're lucky. We have a great audience. You're allowed to use multisyllabic words on the show, which is not always the case. Um, we have really, uh, we really have great viewers. And our, uh, while other show, news shows have been declining, Sunday morning has been going up. And we are, um, and I think it's, we have a wonderful executive producer who is uh, absolutely brilliant and actually has a house here in East Hampton, but he's working now, so that's why he's not here, probably. I'm sure he'd be here if he could, because he's never heard me talk. <laughs> about anything. Um, we will, and, and we have Jane Pauley anchoring now, who was a seamless uh, fit. Everyone was very sad when Charles Osgood retired. And we love him. We continue to revere him. He comes back at Christmas time, but Jane was a really smooth transition. Um, the correspondents, I think the other correspondents that I get to work with are brilliant, as are our producers. Our video editors, we have amazing camera crews who work with us. And we, will, we won't, the, the thing is that everyone thinks we'll do a story on everything. So people always are pitching stories to you. And sometimes they're so good and you just can't do them because you just can't fit them in. Um, so we can't do a story on everything, but we will do a story on anything. So I've done stories on everything from people who climb trees, 
for a hobby and sleep in giant sequoias overnight uh, to, you know, just about any other, and our show has covered just about any subject you can imagine. So there's really nothing that we won't do a story on. We even did a story on colonics a few years ago, and I was really glad that I didn't have to do that one. So. What was your favorite interview? Well, since we're in the Baldwin room, I should say Alec Baldwin was one of my favorites. He was funny. He was, he's really smart, as people around here know. He's philanthropic, hence this. And he's a really interesting character. And uh, a couple of um, summers ago, when my son-in-law and my grandson were throwing a football around in Amagansett in the square, he just kind of joined in the game and started playing football with him. And I think that's kind of what he's like. And it, he's very different in person than what his image is like. Um, so he's one, I, I really did like that. Asking you to pick your, you yeah. know that. It's like, I, I'm lucky because if someone says, who's your favorite child, I only have one. But it's like asking people to pick their favorite child. I, I think I've been lucky. I love interviewing authors. I've, I've done two stories where I went on the road with David McCullough. And if you, you know, I can't wait to read his new book, which I'm not doing a story on, but I, I think just talking to him about history and how he does his work, I think, is amazing. Um, I have to say that every woman my age in this room will understand that it was a thrill to interview Robert Redford, um, who was as nice and funny and kept wanting to ask me questions rather than answer questions. He wanted to know about Washington. He wanted to know about being a TV correspondent. And a lot of the people that you interview were just, you know, they're a little bit self-centered. Um, Sen the Senator Kennedy, who I loved interviewing and was one of the great senators and who I knew quite well, the first, I was interviewing him about a, a policy book that he written, and I said, look, let's just this, make this like you and me talking. We're sitting next to each other at dinner. He was the most delightful person to sit next to at dinner. And I said, let's just make it like that. You know, don't make a speech. And he's like, I know, I know, I understand. I got it. I asked him one question, and I'm not kidding. The transcript was 12 pages, single spaced, of the answer, and every once in a while it would say, Read the Braver, excuse me, sir, and he just blow right past me. So that was one I always remember. Other than Redford, who was the person that you've interviewed who you were most thrilled to meet in person? Um, you know, I, I want to go back to one other thing. One of a person that I felt a connection with, and she might even not even remember the interview, but I thought it was one of the best interviews I ever did was Patty Lupone. And if any of you have ever seen her on the stage, you know that she gets, she's so soulful. She has this amazing soul that you can almost see into. And I felt like that was what she was like as a person. Like, I wanted to be best friends with her. Um, I've been lucky to interview a bunch of children's authors, and I love Dave Pilkey of Captain Underpants fame. Um, and so he was somebody that I was actually very thrilled to meet, because I wanted to see what kind of mind would invent Captain Underpants and make a fortune from it. His, his most recent book, and, and we've gotten to be friends over the years, and he's very kind to my grandchildren, but his most recent Dogman book, which is his latest series, uh, the first printing was three million copies. And I will ask you, Bob represented uh, Bill Clinton and James Patterson on their big thriller that they wrote last year. It was the number one fiction book in the country, and how many did it sell? 2.3. Yeah. But so. Michelle Obama did 11. Okay. <laughs> but that's not children's. <laughs> that's different. Um, now, but working for Sunday morning is like such a gift, and so I feel like I'm so lucky to work for that program. Who was the person who was most different than you expected? You know, there are, I'm not going to tell tales out of school because I did pieces on these people, but sometimes you really think you're going to like someone, and then you don't. That happens. And that's really heart, kind of heartbreaking. And you know, sometimes you, people seem like they're going to be really nice. But I would say that 97% of the people that I have interviewed in the entertainment field, anyway, uh, are really nice. Political people are always different. You know there's going to be a lot of baggage. There's a lot of similarities between Washington and Hollywood because their entourages, 
What's interesting is when you interview theater people in New York or people in New York who, people who come to New York, uh, they, they're a little bit different in New York because Broadway is very low key and kind of the ethic there is not to have a big entourage. Although one person I've interviewed both in Hollywood and in New York when he was doing a play there and had no entourage either time was Tom Hanks. And he was a really lovely person both times. Now you started, as you said, when there was no answering machines and no voicemail and none of that. Now there's cable and there's internet and there's cheddar and there's all these other <laughs> hey. things. How have those things changed the news business, the proliferation <laughs> of mechanisms of distribution? Uh, I think they've changed them a lot. I think we now know that Honestly, that lots of people can be on television, be quite good. It used to be really hard to get a job on television, but now we put people, oh, say, Washington lawyers go on television and, you know, they talk. Bob's had more airtime than I have lately because he is an expert on political uh, debates. He has worked in how many presidential debates ten, now? Ten, ten since 1976 yeah. with Roger. Your so husband. he's um, yeah. So he's he's been on television. Um, I think that there's some very good things. Speed is great. Uh, diversity is great. If you want news on almost any subject, you can get it. Uh, fake news is scary, and the idea that people can doctor reports, that people can doctor video. We've seen this recent video of Nancy Pelosi that was doctored. Those things are really scary, but. Um, I think the power of the networks is certainly diluted. When I was uh, starting out as a network correspondent, if you were the law correspondent for a network or the chief White House correspondent, that was a big deal. Everybody recognized you, but now I don't think that's the case so much anymore. Um, people recognize me from Sunday morning, but only if they're Sunday morning viewers. So people have audiences and they have, um, they have people who like to watch those programs. I've been hearing since I joined CBS News in 1972, I'm embarrassed to say, that television news was going away. But most people still get their news from television in some way. So I don't think it's going anywhere. Uh, I think it is much more diverse. I think that young people coming up in the business, I used to say to them, just get a good education. Study politics or English literature or um, the economy, learn how to think, learn how to write, and you don't have to worry about the technical stuff. But now I tell them, you have to do all those things I just said, and you have to learn how to run a camera, you learn, have to learn how to edit in a couple of different ways, because these younger people are being asked to do it all, and especially the people at local stations, they frequently go out, shoot their own video, come in, edit it, and then track it and get their stories on the air. So I think that's changing. Uh, you mentioned when you started out, it was Walter Cronkite, and of course there was David Brinkley and John Chancellor. You all remember those people. Um, does the evening news, 6.30, some places 7 o'clock, does that have a future in this proliferation of content? You know, um, both when I was, this, particularly when I was the law correspondent, but also when I was at the White House, there were lots of times when they wanted to have the chief law correspondent or the chief White House correspondent on the air, on the morning news, and on the evening news. And I used to always say that my motto was, live on the morning news, dead on the evening news, because it's long, a very long day. But now, our, um, I think our morning shows, the way people watch television, our morning shows are as important as our evening news shows. Our, Correspond like now we have, we don't have a chief White House correspondent. We have three very very strong correspondents who do a lot of, um, you know, they they take turns because there's so much travel, so many stories, and the thing that has changed the most is the 24/7 news cycle. That has made everything different, and that is one of the things that is both good and bad. Good because you can find things out immediately but bad because there's always a rush to judgment, mistakes are made, and sometimes the effort is to get it first and maybe sometimes at the expense, that happens at the expense of getting it right. When uh, 
when you started and until relatively recently, there was a coda that you were a reporter and you tried to gather the facts and report them objectively. Now the line has blurred and reporters have become analysts, sometimes pundits. How do you feel about the fact that the pure reporting function has been polluted in that way, particularly on cable? Well, on cable, I think, I, I, I still think it, on television they make a pretty clear delineation between someone who's a commentator and someone who's a reporter. So I think those things change. I mean, I think you would think of, I think of some women that I know, Diana Bash is a reporter, but Gloria Borger is an analyst. So I think those, those jobs are pretty well delineated. Uh, at least on the you know on the major networks and certainly on the major cable networks. On the other hand, you have people like Rachel Maddow, who is a little bit of a hybrid, and both delivers the news and obviously has a very strong opinions of it on it. And you have everybody pretty much at Fox who has strong opinions on everything that they that they tell us. Uh, lately, I'm going to turn to the present day. If you covered the Bill Clinton White House, how would you cover Donald Trump? No press briefings. The only time you talk to him is he's going to the helicopter with the noise in the background. How would you, applying your considerable skills to coverage, apply them to this White House? You know, um, I have this nightmare. And <laughs> I'll tell you what the nightmare is. The nightmare is that it's like four o'clock in the morning and it's the news desk calling me and saying, it's four o'clock in the morning, why aren't you at Andrews Air Force Base? The plane's taking off. And I'm saying, you said I didn't have to do that anymore. I don't have to do that anymore. And I'm so glad I don't have to do that anymore. Uh, I, think I am too. I think it's, I think it's so much harder. And, and just the other night, um, I had a, a chance to talk with two of our White House correspondents and the third is a a good friend and, and somebody that I talk to frequently and their lives are so, uh, they don't really have lives. They just work all the time. One of them has a new baby and is in despair about how she's going to handle having a new baby. The other one's trying to have a baby and is, you know, would like to have a baby at some point and wondering how you go about doing that. Um, I think you can do it all. But I think it is very hard. It is a much more demanding job, I will say. I think that you have to try to figure out in any organization who knows things. And in this administration, you have to be very careful because the normal, well, normally there are certain people who have certain jobs, and if they tell you something's going to happen and you want to report it, you could take that to the bank. But in this administration, that doesn't always happen. And the only person who really knows what the president is going to do is the president. So you have to, so if you are covering uh, that, you have to very carefully, if, if you're hearing the president is going to do X, Y, or Z, you have to be really careful to couch it in um, sources close to the White House say the president is expected to do X, Y, or Z because you can't really take it to the bank. So I think that's really hard. Um, I think also, it's really hard if you have someone who considers the press. Now, I've never seen a president who loves his press corps. We're, our job is to be adversarial with the president. But it is hard when you have someone who calls reporters the enemy of the people. And I think that it would be hard. You'd really have to. Um, I joked earlier about being surly because the president was always late. But I think you have to be careful not to let your feelings, whatever names you're called, you have to let it bounce off you and try to report the news. Um, and not do it in a knee-jerk way. And I think that part is really hard if you feel under attack. Um, but I have been impressed with at least the way the CBS team has done it. I, I'm really, I'm um, quite impressed with the way our people have done that. Now let's drill down on that. Trump in these massive rallies points to the cameras back here and basically encourages violence against reporters. Just yesterday, he joked about how in Russia, 
it's easier to deal with reporters. And of course, Putin, as we know, has killed 25. He has called reporters repeatedly enemy of the people. What's the long-term effect of that um, for our democracy? I'm hoping that the public understands that the people who are giving you the news are trying to give it to you straight. And in, in most cases, I won't say in every case, but they're generally trying to do it in a way that where they are able to convey what is really going on, not just what the people in power want to tell you is going on, because that's a completely different thing. Your job as a reporter is to say what's really going on. If somebody says, we've added X number of jobs, and then you go and look at what the facts are, and you find out we added a much lower number of jobs, then it's your job to report that discrepancy. That, that shouldn't make you an enemy of the people. So my hope is that uh, those who get the information will understand that they, are, that they are getting it from people who are trying to inform them about what's going on. But it's hard. And as I said, I think it would be hard covering someone who um, told you every day that you somehow had the interests, you didn't have the best interests of Americans at heart. You would know in yourself that that wasn't true, but it would be hard to hear every day. Now I'm going to open it up to questions from you folks. <laughs> love, to, love to entertain your questions and talk about anything you want to talk about, please. <laughs> that was so nice of you. Thank you. <laughs> it wasn't your idea, okay. <laughs> You know, I have, I have great respect for Chuck Todd, and I think that when you are a reporter, you are interviewing, yes, you're interviewing a man, but you are in, interviewing the elected president of the United States. So maybe it's your job to try to be calm, to try to ask your questions, and not to try to one-up the president so much. So, and I, and I think we saw that in the same thing with the George... Stephanopoulos interview. I mean, George asked questions in an inquiring way. It was the answers that got everybody talking. But I think when you interview a president that you want to be respectful, even if you are not being respected. Now, you know, there's a famous incident that everybody knows. My dear friend, my mentor, Dan Rather, uh, was once asked by President Nixon, um, Dan stood up and he got a lot of applause and the president said to him, are you running for something, Mr. Rather? And Dan replied, no, are you, Mr. President? And if you remember that, mo many of you, thank goodness, are too young to remember that. But that, at that time, everyone was like, oh, my goodness. Uh, but I think Dan felt that he had to stand his ground and that that was a, you know, he, he, he said it in a... Um, a way that some people didn't like, but I think that he felt was appropriate. So I, I know that sometimes people can be, uh, they expect you to behave in a certain way, not because of the man, but because of the office. And I think that, that gets to the basic point I was making before, that grappling with that is, a, is hard. Sure. Yes. Yay! <laughs> um, I met you 30 years ago at the FBI Academy. And was I giving them all my phone number and telling them to call me and give me stories? And that works, by the way. It does. It did. It does. It does. Um, I appreciated your candor then. Perhaps to your husband as well. Do you think Judge Muller's Ever gain traction, and will we ever? 
You mean you mean from from Robert Mueller? He's not not a judge. He was former FBI director, um, U.S. Attorney. U.S. Attorney, Assistant Attorney General. Bob, why don't you take that one since you uh, are a I've lawyer? No, I know him really well, and for a long time, you couldn't have picked a better man to do that job. It is an impossible job. I think he did everything he could. There are those, one of my partners wrote an op-ed in the New York Times to this effect, who feel that he should have reached a judgment, not passed it to main justice, as to whether there was a pursuable offense with respect to obstruction of justice. That's a, you know, it's a debate. It's a difference of opinion. A 428-page report written by a lawyer is not going to, although it's been number one, two, and three on the New York Times bestseller list, most people have not read it. And the Democrats in the House have clearly decided that the only way for it to get traction is to have the results presented orally. That will happen on July 17th when he appears before two committees, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. The question will be whether he will, as he said in his brief conference, it wasn't a press conference, it was just a statement, stay within the four corners of the report or whether he will editorialize. If he stays within the four corners of the report, the sound bites, the cable coverage, the viral effects will get people's attention in a way that the written report didn't. The big question will be whether he goes beyond that. If he does, then Katie bar the door. John, John has a question. John. Yeah. The founder of Cheddar. Yay. <laughs> um, I spent a ton of time thinking about Fox News. Uh, I think too many people are caught up on the content of Fox News. That content, I believe, for You know, I think it, it, you're seeing it in what MSNBC is doing because as Fox has positioned itself on the right, MSNBC has positioned itself on the left. I think the networks, there's a lot of stuff involving their broadcast licensing that the cables don't have to deal with. I think they still try to remain uh, as objective as they can. I don't see them going in another direction. They may introduce more commentary, particularly on the morning shows, which are becoming, as we said, more and more important. But I, I don't see that happening. Even, you know, I think it has to do with what, what most people think is their broadcasting integrity. So I don't, I don't see that happening. I think that going away from television news has to do with more lifestyle changes than anything else. I mean, my parents, used to come home, you know, my dad would get home like at five o'clock and we'd eat dinner right then as soon as he walked in the door and then we'd sit down and watch the news. But families don't live like that anymore and so I think that has something to do with it and also the fact that we, as you have capitalized on and others have, we have so many other ways to get our news from the internet. Um, it's, not, it's not so much about content, it's more about how are people going to get the news? And this is why I think if there's any change, what I see is that networks, particularly CBS now has a 24-hour cable um, operation. Streaming. And, I'm sorry, streaming operation. And we are all asked to participate and do it gladly because we want this thing to, to go forward. We may not be working in it as our primary reason, but we know the kids that are coming up behind us this may be the way the news gets out, and we want it to work. I, I need a woman to ask a question. Wait a minute. We've got to hear from a woman. A woman want to ask All right, one? I'm going to ask Bob a question. Oh, you want to ask a question? Yeah. Her question was, what's the climate like in Washington? Uh, whether it's changed or not. I mean, it's sort of interesting if you go to things like the Kennedy Center honors, where you used to see in every administration 
you would see people from uh, you would see people at the Kennedy Center honors from whichever administration was in power. You'd see top officials there. But this president, um, because a couple of years ago, uh, some of the participants said they wouldn't go to the White House. So this president hasn't gone to the honors. And therefore, no one else in the administration will go to the honors. Um, I see people around. I, I, I'm in a group of women who meet together and we try to bring in people from the administration as well as people from different branches of the different branches of government, particularly from Congress. And I will, you will see people in the same room. You'll see, you know, Kellyanne Conway in the same room with Nancy Pelosi. So not that they are um, hugging each other, but I think that you will see people um, try at least to figure out if there's some way that they can have a meeting of the minds. But it's, it's less collegial, probably, than it was in previous administrations, I would have to say. I, I was going to ask my husband a question, because he has been, as I told you, he's the master of all the debaters, and I don't, uh, of all the debates, and I don't want you to leave here tonight without my asking him, you just saw two nights of debates. Do you have... You know, are you handicapping anybody? Do you have a pick? What's your view of what happened this past week over those two nights? I've done uh, 10 cycles since 1976, uh, often playing the Republican in the rehearsals, but also being part of the prep team. Uh, started out with Mondale, did Obama, did Hillary. I've done 42 debates with Hillary, all the Senate debates, all the primary debates, and I never get in to primaries except for Hillary because of our, our dear friendship. So I'm not involved with any candidate this time and I won't be until the general and then if they want my help, I'll be there. Uh, but I've been on, as Rita said, on a lot of shows talking about the process. I think that um, <clears throat> Tom Perez and Mary Beth Cahill and the, their team at the DNC had a very hard challenge because when you've got 24 candidates You've got to set criteria, and you've got to narrow it down. And they did the best they could with the criteria of number of contributors and status in the polls. It'll ratchet up for July 30th and 31st, so hopefully the stage will shrink. And we'll end up, as we did in 08, where we started out with 11. We eventually went down to Edwards, Obama, and Hillary. Then we went down to Obama and Hillary. I think that'll probably happen again, although I don't know that it'll get as far down as one or two. I think that um, it's impossible to prepare, uh, it's impossible to anticipate in a measured way when you'll have maybe seven, eight minutes to talk during the two hours and where everybody's going to try to get involved and break the rules and talk beyond the 60 seconds or the 30 seconds. I think Elizabeth Warren had a really good night on Wednesday. We've all forgotten about Wednesday. That's the detriment of going on the first night. But she, she had a very, very good night. Um, I think uh, Julian Castro broke through a little bit. I didn't feel that any of the others on the first night really had breakthrough performances. On uh, Thursday night, it was obviously a very interesting uh, night. Uh, Kamala Harris did a terrific job breaking through. She's in the first tier anyway, but now I'm sure she's much more solid in the first tier. Um, I think it's a big mistake uh, what some of the immediate pundits do to count out Joe Biden. He's been five decades in public service, has done a whole lot of good things for a whole lot of good people. I remember in 1984, when the first debate between Mondale and Reagan, Reagan was found wandering up Highway 101 in California, and the Wall Street Journal, hardly a bastion of Democrats, uh, wrote a front page story about his mental state then with one line, I will make, not take advantage of my opponent's youth and inexperience for political purposes. He turned it around and got reelected president of the United States. So I think it's very premature based on one debate, two nights, of 12 
in June of the year before November of 2020 to count anybody in or out. I, I personally hope some of the unknowns will become even more unknown and disappear because <laughs> they add nothing. Uh, but I think it's going to be a long road. It's a long race. It's not a sprint. Premature to make judgments. Um, but the thing that worries me about it, and it always worries me when I'm doing prep or I'm watching, there were many things that were said on Wednesday and Thursday that will be killer 30-second commercials for Donald Trump. So you have, when you do this prep, and we found it with Hillary, we found it in any contested primary situation, you've got to keep an eye on the general, but if you don't get the nomination, you won't get to the general. And it's the activists who go to the primaries and the caucuses that will give you the nomination. So that, as you watch these debates as sophisticated viewers, and I'll bet there are a lot of politically interested people in this audience, keep in mind that terrible dichotomy that these candidates are facing. But it's going to be a long and interesting road to November of 2020. We probably have time for one more question. You had your hand up back there. <laughs> we have a woman here, yeah, too. Yeah, she had her hand right. up. Yeah. Go ahead, both of you. You first, and then you. Go ahead. Yeah. I don't think you. I don't think you're hearing that from us in any way. Well, he's a Democrat. No, I, I'm a political person. She's a reporter. Okay. Well, that, wait, did you have a question? <laughs> uh, let me let me re let me let me reply. Yeah. yeah. No, that's fair. Let me. I'm sorry, but I, I just stood up and talked about changing. I just sat here and talked about saying that you couldn't do things, uh, policy things, because, you know, you couldn't do welfare until you did health care and then abandoning that. I talked about saying that you couldn't balance the budget and your political person tells you to balance the budget and you decide that you've got to balance the budget. So I, to say that there was not a, uh, a, an objective look, I think, is completely wrong. We can get into the Me Too stuff because I think that has been an issue in, in, in many cases. Whether, whether you like Ted Kennedy or not, he was considered to be one of the most effective and best senators in the history of the United States Senate by many, many counts. Uh, Bill Clinton, I, I didn't cover, and maybe part of the way I look at Clinton was I covered the first term, not the second term. So I talked about my experiences in coverage. But I, I understand this is an emotional issue from, for you, but I don't think you listen carefully. First of all, separate her from me. She's a reporter. I'm an advocate. So don't blame her for what I said. But let me reply directly to your question. Um, well, she's an objective reporter, and what you heard from her, I think, was an objective analysis of some of the people she covered. I'm an advocate, and I love Bill Clinton, but I'll be the first... I'll, well, no, we'll talk about that in a minute. I'll be the first one, the first one, to criticize what he did. And I do that, and if you read Hillary's book, you'll find out yours truly was the person who had to tell her about Monica. Don't think that was fun, ma'am. So I am very, very aware of the problems that he and others on my side have had and brought to the presidency. But I also look at 10,000 lies. 
I look at the destruction of alliances around the world. I look at all the other things that are going on, and boy, do I want to get rid of him in 2020. Now, your turn. I, and I want to say that I have no comment on that. <laughs> I honestly have. I, I think when you're a reporter, it's your job to report on what people are saying out there. We did not in any way, also I want to emphasize, talk about, we didn't talk about Me Too of any of these candidates. We, didn't, we weren't discussing that about Trump. And, and no one here suggested anything about Trump, whether it was uh, Bob or me. Uh, all of the things that you just stood up and said about other people had to do with private behavior, which we didn't go into, and we didn't go into that about President Trump. So I, I feel like that was a kind of a misplaced attack. That's my personal opinion. The question, the question is why report tweets? Because they're there, because they're the news. You can't, you can't say that they're, you can't say that they're, uh, when you're a reporter, you just have to say the president today tweeted X, Y, or Z because that's what the president does. And, and this president, a lot of how he governs is on Twitter. So that's the only way. So you shouldn't. Uh, you, can't, you can't do that. You can't do that. They have declared that they are official White House statements in answer to questions. Reporters can't not cover them. I don't disagree with that, but to say they don't cover them would be to, to de delegate their job. I, I think she's the reporter, not me, but when the White House says they're official statements, you can't ignore them. Okay, I think we should probably...